Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the most frequent questions that I receive has to do with sin. But not just any sin or sin in a general sense, but one very specific sin. And what am I speaking about? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is what we're going to look at in today's study. What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Am I able to do this tremendously evil act today? Or is it something that was only done or able to do in the time of Yeshua when Jesus walked upon this earth? So we're going to look at this issue according to the revelation of God's word. With that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 12. The book of Matthew and chapter 12. Now, whenever you study a passage in the Bible, you need to realize that context is important. That means that you need to learn and read what happened before the passage you're studying and also what took place after it. And most New Testament scholars, they teach, and I would agree with them, that it's even more important when we study the Gospels. For the Gospels weave together accounts, historical events concerning Yeshua, and how these are put together, they were all done so under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And there is revelation, there is truth, there is information in how the Scripture was compiled under the leadership of, of course, the Holy Spirit. Now, when we look at this 12th chapter, we saw something. We saw that last week, Messiah was, was invited to a synagogue. But those who invited him did not do so for the right reasons. No, they were doing so to entrap him. That means they wanted him to do something in order that they could discredit him. Let me ask you something. Is that a, a Torah obedient attitude? See, the Torah tells us in a general sense, Paul spoke of this in Galatians. All the Torah in one statement. Via hafta areacha kamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. Were they loving Yeshua when they said, come to our synagogue? And when they brought that man who had a, a shriveled up, weak, dried up hand? No, they were not. They weren't loving Yeshua and they weren't loving this man. Now we have to be careful. This is not an indictment against that nation, that people, the Jewish people. You see, when we look as we did last week, the vast majority of the people, when they witnessed this glorious miracle, what did they do? They gave glory to God. They knew and they were right. This is God at work. And what should we conclude from that? Well, what we talked about last week, the significance of why so many healing miracles that Yeshua did, he did them specifically on Shabbat, that is, on the Sabbath day. And we learn why that was. Because, by and large, unless it was a matter of life and death, something extremely serious, the people were in great pain, people didn't go to the doctors today, to the hospital on the Shabbat. But what can be done? Well, on Shabbat, the Torah is read. And in every synagogue, doesn't matter where you are, every synagogue, when the Torah is read, immediately thereafter, there's prayers. Prayers for healing, 
Prayer for the sick. That God, that he might move even on that Shabbat and bring about healing. So when Messiah did this act, this miracle, this restoration of this man's hand, when he did this miracle of healing, the people, the vast majority, they understood something. This was God among them. Remember that phrase, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. And the people in one accord, they were praising God. But here's the problem. When those leaders saw this, they were jealous, they were envious, and they did something. They spoke to the people saying, hold on, you need to realize something. That he did this miracle by demonic influence. He cast out demons with who? Well, they use a Hebrew expression. In Hebrew, it's Baal Zavuv, Lord or Master of the Flies. It is a, a term for the prince of this age. And of course, we're speaking about Satan. What did they say? They said he does these acts, these so-called miracles. But really, he's getting his power from who? From Satan, from the prince of darkness, from the father of lies. And it's with this in our minds that we can continue and learn biblical truth from today's passage. So again, look with me to chapter 12 of Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. We read these words. And on account of this. Now, this is a phrase of instruction. Whenever we come across something like that, on account of this, it, it is instruction for the reader to say, I can't go on and read this verse and study this upcoming passage until I remember what has just happened. So on account of this, sometimes we have that phrase, and after these things, both of those terms are, are a literary device to tell us in order to reach the right conclusion, the right interpretation we need to remember as we discuss what had happened. Verse 31. On account of this, Yeshua is speaking and he says, I say to you. Now it begins in a great way. It begins by him saying, Every or all sin and blasphemy will be forgiven for men. Meaning this, and that's exactly what it says, that God, he is a God of forgiveness, and therefore he will forgive every sin and every act of blasphemy. He's going to do that for men, for humanity. but. There is a, a stipulation. And what is that? We'll keep reading. He also says, middle of verse 31. Now, this second half of the verse, it has a conjunction, a conjunction of contrast or of difference. So every sin, in a general sense, every sin, all blasphemy, is going to be forgiven for men. But, he says, and here's the exception, but the blasphemy. Now, if we look back up to the first part of verse 31, before the word blasphemy, we don't see the definite article. What does that mean? We're speaking about blasphemy in a general sense. But when we get to the second part of our verse, we learn something. We learn that it's speaking about specifically one form of blasphemy. And what is that? Keep reading. He says, but the blasphemy of the spirit. Now, the spirit here that we're speaking about, and in a moment we'll see this undeniably, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. Some translators, in order to help you understand that now, they'll put it in parentheses or in italicize. But we're speaking most assuredly about the Holy Spirit. So he says, but... Blasphemy of the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, 
will not be forgiven of or for men. And then he says to emphasize this so we have no misunderstanding. Notice what he says in the next verse, verse 32. And whatever word should be said against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven by him. So any word, any blasphemous statement that is said against the Son of Man and Yeshua speaking about himself, it can be forgiven. And let me just simply say before we go any further, forgiveness, notice it says will be, all of this will be forgiven. And that will be is in the passive meaning something must make it able to be forgiven. And why is it in the future? Because we're speaking about what makes it possible. And that is the cross of Christ. The shedding of the blood of Yeshua, Jesus' own blood. When he died upon that tree nearly 2,000 years ago, that and that alone is what makes sin, all sin, and generally speaking, blasphemy forgiven. And that's why he says here, and the word that is spoken against the Son of Man shall be forgiven of him. But he says, but every word that should be spoken against the Holy Spirit, and here that phrase is there, the Holy Spirit. Every word that's spoken against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven by him or of him. Now, this is significant. This is why we know we're talking about the unpardonable sin. That sin which cannot be forgiven. And notice what he says, verse 32 at the end. He says, and not in this age or this world and not in the coming, meaning not in the coming age, the coming world, which is the kingdom. Now, that phrase that emphasizes what we've just talked about, won't be forgiven not in this age or in the coming age. That tells us this is serious. And therefore, we need to answer the question, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And, and how does one commit it? And if it's even possible to be committed today? Well, Remember that I said, and this is the third time, third time I'm going to allude to it. This all has to do with rightly bringing the context into this passage. Because of those leaders that said what he did, he did by the prince of darkness. The ruler of this world in this time frame, speaking about Satan Beelzebub. And here's what we see. I want just to go back to a very important verse. Look at verse 25. And notice what it says here. But Jesus. Very important. But Yeshua, knowing their thoughts. Now, this implies something. That is, Yeshua understood. He knew, that's what the text says, exactly what they were thinking. And what were they thinking? We talked about it. They witnessed a miracle, and they knew it. They knew that he was sent by God. They knew that it was through the Holy Spirit that he did these things. He knew that, and they knew it. But here's the problem. They, in defiance, out of jealousy and envy, Instead of understanding their leadership position to bring people to the truth, what did they do? They weren't being a good influence. They weren't making the people lead them in good deeds. But what did they do? They, with knowledge, they said, well, we know that he did it through the Holy Spirit, but we're going to announce and proclaim that he did it by means of Satan. And that, in essence, is what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Now, the questions that I receive more often than not concerning this issue, 
probably at least 30% of them, is written by an individual that is greatly burdened that perhaps he or she had done just that. That they have committed the unforgivable sin that they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And I want to be very specific for a moment. There are many biblical scholars, much smarter than me, greater experience, and they say this. They say that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cannot be done today. Why? For to be done, it has to be based upon witnessing firsthand with your own eyes a miracle that Yeshua performed when he was on this planet some nearly 2,000 years ago. He's not here bodily. We still see miracles, but it's not through his own hand, his body before us that we see them. So they say that it cannot be done today. Others would say this. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can be done today, but here's the, the criteria. It is when you have witnessed an undeniable miracle. Something that is God honoring, God glorifying, something that, that meets a need, and you are convicted by the reality. This is God. He did this miracle. It is from God. But instead of acknowledging that, giving him thanks, or just even remaining silent, instead of that, knowing that it's of God, you announce and you say, wait a second, what you've just witnessed is satanic. It is of demonic influence. It's not of God. Now, I doubt if, if there's a person who has seen a miracle and knows it's God that has stated, no, I want to lie in defiance. I want to say that it's Satan, his activity. So most people can be assured that you have not committed this unpardonable act, that you can find forgiveness through the blood of Messiah Yeshua through what Jesus Christ did for you and for me and for all people, Jew and Gentile alike, that they might experience forgiveness. Well, let's move on to the next verse, verse 33. Now, in verse 33, many Bibles don't get this right because two times a word appears, a one-letter word. And it means either or or either. And it speaks about two possible situations. Let's read it. Verse 33. Either, and it's talking about two possibilities. Either you have made a good tree and its fruit is good, or you have made a bad tree and its fruit is bad. It's just that simple. What's it speaking about? And why does this verse appear here? Well, remember, the issue is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And who's doing that? These leaders. And the leaders, and not just leaders, all people. See, whether you know it or not, you are going to influence others. You have a testimony. People are watching you. And you are either going to lead people to the truth, be a blessing in their life, or, God forbid, the opposite. You're going to be a negative influence. You're going to lead people away from the truth. So he says here, either you have made a good tree and its fruit is going to be good, or you've made a bad tree and therefore its fruit is going to be bad. And he says, second half of verse 33, for by the fruit the tree is known. Now we know that in the scripture, Psalm 1 is a good example of this. That, that people oftentimes are likened to trees. And it means that a good person, one that's in God's will, one is under his authority, that person, you can see these things, that they're a believer, that they have faith, they're under his authority, they're operating in the Holy Spirit because they have good deeds, good fruit. Likewise, you can see a person who's not under the authority of the Spirit of God, not a believer because they produce bad fruits. So he says here very clearly, it's not hard to understand this, 
Second part of verse 33, for by the fruit of a tree, you will know. You'll know the tree by its fruit. Verse 34. In verse 34, he continues. This is not new. He's continuing to speak to these leaders. He says, verse 34, a, a generation of vipers. Now, this is a word for a serpent, a snake. And he's speaking to these leaders, and he says, a, a generation of vipers. And why does he say that? Well, this type of, of snake was dangerous. This type of snake didn't do anything positive for humanity. And therefore, he says, how is it that you are able to speak good when you are evil, being evil? He says there's deceit here. What did he just talk, talk about? Good trees, good fruit. Bad trees, bad fruit. But these, these are doing something. They are speaking good things, religious things, holy things, scriptural things, but they are evil. And what is that? That is deceit. And who is the father of deceit? The Bible says the father of lies are Satan. And this generation, these who he's pointing to, they are, he's saying, you are of the enemy. It's not Yeshua. He's doing good things. He's speaking good things, and he's doing good things. But you propose to be good people. You say spiritual things, religious things, the right things, but you are being evil. Now, verse verse. 30, 34, second part. For out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaks. So you can tell someone by, by not only their deeds, but their words. If you listen long enough. And what he's saying here is that your words, speaking to these leaders, convict you. Because you know you are speaking lies. You come across speaking good things, but you are liars and you are sons of the great liar. Once more, middle of verse 34. For by the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 35. The good man from a good treasury of his heart he brings forth, he casts out, that is, he produces. So we see a heart that's good, has treasures of a good heart, produces good things. But, middle of verse 35, but an evil man, and what's good and evil? Good is God's will. Bad is that which is not God's will. It may not look evil, it may not look uh, full of malice and wicked, but anything that is not God's will, is evil. So he says, verse 35, the second half, and the evil man from evil treasures, he cast out, he produces evil. So they might say the right thing, but in the end, what is going to be the key? The heart condition. And Messiah came that he might give us a new heart, a circumcised heart, a heart. And what does circumcision speak to? Circumcision is the death of the flesh. Flesh and evil, they go together. So that we might live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. These individuals are not. Verse 36. For I say to you that every Idle word. Now that word idle, it's the word argon. It's a word of laziness. It's a word that doesn't have any profit. So ask yourself something. The words you speak, are they profitable for others? Are they producing outcome, good deeds, happenings in people's life? What these leaders said. What Messiah did, he does by, by the prince of this world, by demons. Is that something that, that is good? Something that produces a positive outcome? No, because they are lying. 
And he knows, remember verse 25, he knows that they are lying. He's speaking to their heart, and their heart is deceitful. So he says, I say to you that every idle word which is spoken by men, it will be given for its account, meaning it is going to be taken to account when? On judgment day. Now, it's so interesting because so often today within the church, within Christianity, at conferences, they, they don't want you to speak much about judgment, about condemnation, or about judgment day. But if you've been following along with me, Messiah, he speaks frequently about Judgment Day. And I've made mention to you numerous times that there is that inherent relationship between Judgment Day and the kingdom of God being established. First comes judgment, and then the outcome of judgment is the kingdom of God. So look again at our text. For I say to you that every idle word which is spoken of men they will have to give, he will have to give an account concerning it on judgment day. For from your words you are justified, and from or by your words you are condemned, will be condemned. And what word is he speaking about here? If we say the right thing, nice things, good things, spiritual things, no. It's a reference to the gospel. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, with these words, you're going to be justified. But if you deny that, you don't believe, you do not confess your sin and that through his death on the cross and through his resurrection that you are forgiven, if you say no to that, then you will be condemned. It's that simple. You have a wonderful opportunity, an opportunity to get it right, to just simply say, I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you've died for my sin and that you rose from the dead victoriously, signifying the victorious life that I can live now, producing good fruit and the salvation I'll have for eternal in your kingdom. Say the right words. Well, I'm out of time. Until next week, shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.